Hey guys, this is V-Man from No Budget Productions uh, on the Pizza Roll Diaries. A little bit of a late edition today. Uh, and with me today is uh, Steven Jetson from, you guys may know him as the Admiral from Axonar. Steven, how are we doing today, buddy? We're doing well. How about you? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. So, uh, yeah, we got a little bit late of a start today uh, to... Uh, have you on and I want to say thank you for coming on and uh, being with me today um I haven't seen you since uh haven't seen you since Vegas man um, yeah. it's it's been it's been too long <laughs> I agree I agree I had a great I had a great time for uh, for those people who don't know <laughs> the first time that we actually really met is in McCarran Airport in Vegas and uh, we uh, we took an uber to the Rio and um, then just had a blast uh, when yeah. we were um, when we were at the convention. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was one of those things where, you know, I mean, I, of course I, I saw you on, on the Axonar, um, you know, but it's, it's in my mind, it's like, this is one of those larger than life people and, you know, you never get to meet them, but, you know, seeing you in the airport for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you I don't think you realize the scope of who you are, you know, at least in my mind, you know. Um, you know, I, I find it really, really weird because um, I've been I've been a professional singer since 1986 and mm -hmm. I've been teaching since 91 and I now teach the university and um, I've gotten more recognition from people as at, at, for my for my three seconds of just the picture of me as Admiral Slater than almost everything else I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, Alec loves to tell that story about when I was walking uh, from the library to the building that I'm working that I'm in right now. And they were having, uh, we always have these little groups that come in and they're welcomed and they get a tour of the campus and everything. And there was a larger group that was touring the campus, like maybe 20 people. And they're these two, guys in the back and I'm I think I was dressed in a jacket and tie which I usually wear yep. and I was walking from the library back to fine arts and one of them looked at me and did a perfect double take and then looked at his friend and said dude that's Admiral Slater <laughs> and I just smiled and I told Alec and he went that's the greatest thing I've ever heard you know <laughs> and and then, and then um, uh, Jonathan was nice enough to um, give me a give me a bigger role in um, in interlude. And uh, I understand that I'll be working for the V Man sometime soon. Yep, I will have something for the the my final season of Constar. I, I I'm still working out the kinks of what exactly I want to do because I have uh, you know some films written and some that I. I want to do going forward but yeah i i do want to work with you at one point yeah. uh you know get you on there you know get you on my com box per se you know because i like it <laughs> i like so, it so going back to uh we'll, we'll go through the timeline um we'll, we'll go through the acts in our film um and then we'll go through the vegas but before we get to those things um what what drew you to Star Trek in general. What makes you a fan of the series? What what made you watch? You know, what was your first iteration of 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 the whole thing? What what makes you what makes you like the show? Well, my first iteration was when it was uh, when it was originally broadcast. Um, I'm 61 years old, mm -hmm. so I was around back then. Now, my dad would basically we'd you know, we'd be looking for something to watch on, mm, on Tuesdays at seven o'clock, if I remember, uh, mm -hmm. on NBC. And we'd come across this and he goes, ah, it's that thing with the guy with the pointy ears. Let's not watch this. Isn't Lawrence Swelk on or something like that. <laughs> and um, so I got to see a little bit of it at that point, mm -hmm. but it was mostly when it was in syndication, when I was coming home from junior high, um, did not have a real good adolescence, got got beat up a lot, got made fun of, mostly because I was the singer, I was the musician, I didn't do I didn't do sports mostly. And uh, I came home 
three thirty in the afternoon, Star Trek's on, and I turned it on, and here is this. First of all, here's this amazing captain, who just is in control of everything, and when he's not, he knows who to contact, and he's got this group of people who's who's basically being his wonderful support, and they're on this fabulous ship. The I think the the one person I fell in love with even before Rand and Uhura, <laughs> for obvious reasons, was the Enterprise. I, I just love that ship. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just got hooked into it and just watched him over and over and over. And for somebody who was in a position of just feeling very, very vulnerable and very hurt, I found solace there. And that's the big thing that drew me to Star Trek. Um, and then watching the iteration, the um, the various versions going in and going on to it, I just went, yep, this I love. I love this. And, <clears throat> and then now looking at how much that love is familiar with so many people and how much that resonates with so many people. And that's where the fan films come from. Um, and everybody takes it at a different way. Um, some people are just, they love the ethos of the idea of people being treated and looked upon for who they are and the best of their abilities and their diversity brings something, um, brings something wonderful to the play. And that's what drew me to Star Trek. Well, I, I think, I think there's a common theme among Star Trek fans, um, of course, the outside world who who doesn't get it, they they would look at us as much like in Galaxy Quest. They would look at us as as the nerd, you know, who is outsider. But if if you look at the actual fan, there's there is that sense of you know we are the the more artistic, we are the more picked on, we are the more um, uh, you know kind of oppressed in a sense, you know, uh, you know. Um, you know, from the jock or or the person who's you know just picked on. You know, we walk home from school. We're not the one who's usually you know picking on someone. We're usually the person being picked on. Right. Um, so we gravitate more towards Star Trek because we see that hope of people who are equal, people who are on equal ground, people who work together. Right. Um, and I think, and when you watch the Star Trek stories, um, you know, we we see you know, not only the hopeful world, but we see ourselves in that world where, exactly. man, if we, could, if we could only be like that, if it could only, you know, if we could only be in that world, if, if the world could be like that, like we, we wouldn't have to exist in this and, and things could be better, you know? Right. Um, and, and in a sense, it's that hopeful world. <laughs> I don't think they necessarily intended, um, but we all gravitate towards because it's something that we, we, we want to desperately get out of, you know, um, exactly. it's very appealing to, uh, you know, the, the, the junior high type kids, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's a very fundamental level, you know, right. Um, <laughs> but I, I like that. Yeah. Well, it, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, at that, at that point of, at the point of your life where you are trying to figure out who am I, how do I fit in? And you're not finding a lot of, I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's different now, but it's different now because, yeah. <clears throat> there's more of an acceptance of the artistic uh, now because you've got kids who are really big into musicals and, and yeah. do all of that. But when you're, but back in that age, you were a jock or you were a nerd or you were a geek yeah. and it, you were easy pickings. And to be able to find a universe where you're actually valued is, is fabulous. And at that particular time, as you hit it on the head, at that particular time in your growth, um, finding something like that to hang on to is so important. Well, it just in, in my experience, um, you know, my my dad's dad was, you know, very much work, home, work, home. And then my dad kind of, you know, that bled over into that um, where, you know, he, he kind of changed the mold a little bit, whereas work, home. And on the weekend, sometimes barbecue, you know, it, it, it changed right. a little bit where, you know, then with me, it's like I was more of the artsy fartsy kid. You know, I, I enjoyed that. And I, I kind of saw that I want more than just work home, work home, you know, um, you know, where, you know, we, we're that generation of 
we were picked on. I don't want to do that. You know, and I'm raising my kid to right. be, no, no, hey, be the artsy fartsy kid. Let yeah. be that. Excel. Like, go ahead. It's okay. You know, yeah. um, whereas what, the, you know, the previous generation, they didn't grow up on that. So I think you're seeing the transition. Um, of course, Star Trek is different now because it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the same Star Trek because the generations are completely different. Um, and it's meant, you know, it's just like comic books. Comic books are completely different. It's yeah. meant for a different generation, you know. Um, I think that's why it gets such uh, <laughs> such vitriol from some of the older fans because they're like, this ain't Star Trek. You know, it's a, it's the get off my lawn mentality, you know. Exactly. Um, but it's, it's change, you know. Um, not necessarily a bad change. It's just, you know, uh, resistant. To, to, yeah. It's a change, yeah. and uh, resistance to change is futile. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, which, uh, which, if you don't mind me asking, uh, which, which of your favorite uh, uh, outside of classic Trek? Because I assume classic Trek will probably be your favorite. Um, which of the, uh, uh, which of the, the, which one? The spinoffs. Yes. Which, which of the spinoffs would have been your favorite? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> well, as everybody knows, I'm a musician. So it's the music that carries me a lot. Um, the, the main theme, the main intro for Voyager, mm -hmm. when I saw it for the first time, I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. Uh, but the more that I go back at them now, um, the one that really, really sticks with me in just in terms of really looking at the human condition in every single way is DS9. Yeah. <clears throat> because there's always this big question of whether or not Gene would like, would have liked DS9, because I think that it was the first one that really didn't involve him at all. If I remember correctly, it was all it was all Rick Berman. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to tell episodic um, uh, television and he wanted to do it in in our in the Star Trek universe, which meant you had to go places that I don't think Gene ever dared going. You know, um, we all know that he wanted to talk about racism. And his example for that was to make it as blatantly obvious as possible by having one guy with white paint on one side and black paint on the other. And we all went, well, yeah, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to beat us over the head. He's not going to beat us over the head with it. In DS9, you were facing it and you had no choice. And then also... You know, we have the Defiant, and, <laughs> and we have some really, really cool. We have some really, really cool video effects, and um, but the more I look at it, DS Nine just seems to be strong, just very, right. very strong. And it's interesting because it was, I think, before Enterprise came out, it was the one that didn't have the good, didn't have the best ratings, mm -hmm. uh, but they stuck with it. It when, was. It yeah. was the redheaded stepchild. Yeah, it, it 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 was on a network. It, it was it was it was in an awkward time slot. I think for for me it was like ten thirty five right. on a Saturday night. Like yeah. like if you didn't know where it was, like you didn't get to watch it. You know, um, and it, they they gave it to Iris Stephen Bear, and was just kind of like they focused more on Voyager and kind of just disregarded it. So he kind of got to do what he wanted. Um, and and you're right. I don't. I, I do kind of wonder if Gene would have liked it. I, I kind of think I compare when you look at Gene's vision for Star Trek, which is more of next gen season one and compare that to DS nine. It's, it's a complete contrast of what Star Trek should have been. And it's, it's kind of like looking at Star Trek, the motion picture, which was Gene's vision and look at it as opposed to Star Trek two, which is like, no, that's apples and oranges. And I love Star Trek two, but it's distinctly, opposite of what gene wanted for starfleet you know yeah. um ds9 is my favorite trek because I, I think it it really looks at the trek universe the human condition and, and really makes you question uh you know we say we want the perfect world but what what do we want to keep it and what is it what does it exactly mean to be human you know no no uh <laughs> no slander to the term you know um 
Actually, that's a really, really good point because I think DS9 was the first, they started doing it in, they started doing it in, in TNG, but DS9 was the first one that actually showed the, um, that human, the manner that humanity looks at the universe and humanity looks at the Federation <clears throat> is not always the best. Right. Because we saw, I mean, we saw, um, we saw things in the Bajorans that was, that were admirable, that we completely were against. Yep. Same thing with the Klingons, same thing with the Cardassians, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, learning more about the Ferengi and um, and the Klingons uh, and Romulans. But we found out that we're not the greatest, we're not the greatest civilization on this, in this, in this uh, universe. Well, the, the thing about it, if, from what I, when you look at Next Generation, it, it very much was, we have all the answers. Um, we're respectful toward other people's beliefs, but you know, our way is kind of the proper way. And once we're done, we go on to the next adventure with DS nine. You had issues when you fuck up, it's, it's, you're stuck with the problem. And, and, you know, a couple episodes later, or maybe even a season later that, that, that it, the issue comes back and it bites you in the ass. Um, and when, uh, you know, with, you know, you deal with religion, with the Bajorans, you deal with, uh, you know, greed with the Ferengi, you deal with uh, conspiracy with the with the Romulans, you deal with, uh, you know, hostility with the Klingons, like, you're dealing with all these different issues, and it, all of that is is just aspects of, of humanity with ourselves, right. um, and those are constant things, and, you know, Cisco is a very different type of leader than Picard, he doesn't have all the answers, he's a very human leader, much like Kirk was, um, and, and, not only is he a great leader, someone you want to follow in battle, but he's very much a, a, a person, someone you'd go sit and have a beer with, right. um, someone you'd go, you know, have a barbecue with, you know. Um, but he's a very real person. He makes mistakes, like the the one where um, he's trying to bring the Romulans into the war, and Garrick actually does. You know, it's it's that Garrick and uh, Cisco one, um, and they're trying to bring the Romulans into the war. Picard would not have done that. Um, oh yeah. But at the end of the episode where Cisco raises the glass, he's like, I can live with it. You know that that trips his mind out. You know he's haunted by that. But yeah. that's one of those episodes where I think that's one of the greatest episodes of all of Trek. I agree. Um, and it makes you ask the question, who's right? Because we're the villains. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it from, from a historical perspective, we fucked up. But that's the only thing we could have done. To, 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 to write the wrong, how many lives were saved? Right. But, I mean, that's that from a trek and a historical, I mean, just from a historical perspective. And that when you look at our own history, I mean, it makes you question. And that's what good Star Trek does. It doesn't give you the answer. It, it drops it off and says, you talk about it. And that starts the conversation. And that's what good Trek always does is it starts the conversation. Exactly. It doesn't give you the answer, you know? That's right. Yeah. But so that that being said, I, man, I see this is why, man, I feel like we needed a couple more days in Vegas. because I, I feel like you and I could just go on I and on. Agree. And on. <laughs> I agree. So we 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 talked at Vegas and you were asked to go and you were one of the people that I mean, you you were such a joy to be around at the Axon Art booth. You helped Alec. You were there, you were a speaker, you were one of the, the, the promoters of, of the booth. Was this one of your first times at a convention or had you been there before? Because according from what I saw, you look like you just fit right on in. What was that like being there? Uh, it wasn't my first convention. Um, I Believe it or not, my first convention was actually in my hometown. Um, I'm from Coralville, Iowa, which is a suburb of Iowa City, uh, where the University of Iowa is. <clears throat> and uh, we had a convention in um, one of the um, one of the small hotels in the area. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, Jimmy Dewan was there, and I think Grace Lee Whitney was there, and George K was there. Maybe Walter. I can't remember. But then my next big convention, my next convention was a larger one. It was in Kansas City. Um, it was one that um, 
I remember I asked some stupid questions to Jimmy Doohan and he just sort of ignored me. Uh, this was the biggest one I've ever been to. You know, this mm -hmm. was just out of this world insane. And all I, I mean, I don't know if I don't know if anybody could see it, but I was just like kid in the candy store. I was just sort of going, "This is the coolest <laughs> thing ever," especially when people started uh, people started uh, dressing up. Um, when we were doing cut, when when they did cosplay, it was just amazing. It was just amazing yeah. to see how far people would go. Uh, I remember, um, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Ray. Ray Myers was talking. It was either Ray or you. He was talking to the guy who dressed. No, it was Shane. Shane Freud. He was talking to the guy who was dressed up as Odo. Oh yeah, and, and looked almost exactly like exactly Ray. like him. Yeah, but then the next day he's dressed up as a Borg, mm -hmm. and you just sort of went, "My God, this is amazing!" Because people yeah. are putting so much effort into it. Um, there was also with very with with a with a few exceptions there was just this feeling of love of yeah. of just acceptance of um this is our place we're happy come on in um and it was really i think a privilege to represent um fan films not just axonar but fan films because people were coming up and they were going, well, what is this? I've never heard of it before. And I talked to him and I said, we're here not to just celebrate Axanar. We're here to celebrate fan films. Yeah. Uh, you need to go to YouTube and start looking up Star Trek fan films. And there it's, it's just an amazing group to belong to. Well, and that was the thing, like that, that was the one thing. I mean, you, I mean, you, you there, you were helping out the booth and everything, but you, yeah, several times you were like, "Hey, check out this guy. He's got 108 fan fit." Like, and and I was like, "Oh, you know, like I, I was so flattered because you know you're you're absolutely right about the camaraderie, um, and the dedication that those people they put into their costumes. Um, the one that I, I, I always will remember, um, and it's because I I'm a uniform guy. That I think that's probably one reason why I I do. Uh, so many fan films is just because I like to dress up in the different ones and I like to have memories more than just the pictures. I like to have, you know, I like to see my friends in the different uniforms, you know, so I'm like, let's go get them, you know. Um, but I've, I have the lower decks uniforms. Um, and I know, uh, you know, I know the different material that they're all made out of, whatnot. But there was one lady who dressed up as uh, the, the green. Oh, yeah. The Orion. Yeah. 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 And uh, you, you remember, you know, you remember the lady that I'm talking about there, yeah. the one with that homemade right. one. Yeah. And I stood behind her in line because the, the first day that I went there, um, yeah, I didn't know that we could just go straight to the, the, the you know, uh, I didn't know our stuff was already done. So I thought we had to wait with the, the regular people, right. you know, so yeah. I stood there for, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, with everyone else, you know, and I'm sitting there looking at this lady who's like maybe five, you know, five people ahead of me. And I'm just kind of gawking at the uniform. I'm sure everyone yeah. thought, man, this guy's a creeper, you know, but I'm looking at the uniform going, that's fucking amazing work. And I'm dissecting yeah. the uniform. Cause I'm like, this is because I know the uniform I have at home is like shit compared to this, you know, it's, this is just great work, you know, and her makeup is awesome. And it's just, it's phenomenal yeah. work, you know, and, and not everybody understands that, you know, um, the difference between a homemade costume and something that's store bought, you know, not everybody gets that. But when you go to a convention where they take that type of work, um, and that was, and that was all around, you saw it all yes. around. Um, there was the guy who was dressed up as, uh, Melvin Belli's character. I mean, I think that was the first one that sort of blew my mind. Um, Melvin Belli's character in, um, in the T in the TOS episode, uh, the friendly angel. Mm, yes. With that big thing. There was a guy done done up like that and you knew that you weren't going to find that at Avenos or wherever that was going to be a handmade uniform yeah. um, then there were people um, along with the person dressed up as Tendi there was somebody dressed up as Dr. Tiana and made a cat, like head. A cat. yes yes yeah. <laughs> and you're just sort of going really wow. yes <laughs> this is amazing yes um I saw people uh, this was the first time that I had seen people in TMP uniforms because I have been told 
by so many people that the costumes for the motion picture were the hardest costumes to make. The yeah. They're, especially the pants that fit into the boots. Yep. Yep. And we had, oh, we had um, officers, we had enlisted men, we had people dressed up as engineering. Mm -hmm. And then there were two guys dressed up in, in Kirk's Admiral uniform. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to have my Slater to have my Slater tunic on. And I've got a picture of me in the Slater tunic with these two guys on my side. And I'm just sort of going, this is amazing. This is just absolutely amazing. And that's yeah. the love. That's yeah. the love. Yeah. It makes you feel, you know, the, the thing about it is like if, you know, I, I, I collect action figures and they had so many of those there. You know, um, they had the, uh, you know, the, the Playmates uh, starships. You know, right. they had so many of those there, you know, um, you know, it, granted, you know, some of them for more of a hefty price than others. Um, but it's like, you know, so much nostalgia there. Um, if you didn't know you wanted it, you do now. And you're like, man, I got to go to <laughs> eBay. You know? um, I mean, you could easily, you know, you, you can easily skip a house payment or two at, at Comic Con because you're like, yes. man, I, I, I desperately want this, you know. Oh, God, yeah. Um, but it was it was so much fun to go. And, you know, of course, Toys R Us is no longer around. But this is like the next best thing of like, man, this is childhood all over again. And it's all you know? Star Trek. And it's all, yes, it's, not, not all Star Trek. I mean, they had a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was just, uh, and, and that was another thing about the costumes that I really, really loved because we had a number of um, crosses. Like we had one guy who was dressed up at Deadpool in a red in a red shirt. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, we had two people who were dressed up from Galaxy Quest. Yes. Uh, we had people dressed up as the Doctor from Doctor mm -hmm. Who. Yeah. And they're just wandering around and just taking it all in. And 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 nobody's going, oh, that's Doctor Who. That doesn't need to be here. You don't belong here. No, no. Yeah. No, yeah. No, and that, the thing about it is like that, that I love is – when when you're like, hey, can I get a picture with you? They're like, oh yeah, sure. And they 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 take you know they take it right on in. And you know the the thing about it is, you, it it's it's so much fun to to be a part of, to be part of those memories yes. of you know having a year of COVID and isolation and away from other people and the negativity of social media and it's like there's so much crap in this world yeah. and it's just like you know so many people get at their wits end and they're like man i can't do this anymore i'm done but to, to go and be at you know where there's so much like you said love and to, to create positive memories and you know to, to have someone walk up to you and be like hey can i get a picture with you because of your costume can you imagine how good that must feel yeah um because I can tell you, me and my red and blue hoodie, nobody wanted a picture with me. Good old me, I did. I'm I'm glad too because I don't like. I, I'm not really big on crowds, you know. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but right. you know, for those people who who put the time into that costume, that's got to feel like a million bucks. Exactly. Be like, you know that. You know, especially the, especially the, the cat head doctor lady. You know, again, I'm terrible with names, so you know, I forget. But that that right there, like you made that person's day. I yeah. saw. I saw that one of the things that made my made my day. You, you know how much I, I love, uh, you know, my son. I always post pictures of him. Yes. Um, we're always doing stuff. But I saw one of the little kids walking around in a Starfleet uniform security. He has his own phaser and everything. And he yes, was I remember him. Yes. Yep. <laughs> that that to me reminded me of when. Mona and I, we I dressed in my red uh, TNG uniform. She had her blue TNG uniform, and Royce had his little Spock costume, and we went trick or treating. Uh, and he, he even had his little Spock ears and 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 wig. Um, and uh, you know, it, it reminded me of of all the times he's filmed. You know, he's he had his uh, uh, I don't know if you remember the the SNL skit with Patrick Stewart where it was Love Boat: The Next Generation. Right. Yes. But Gary Davis sent me. Uh, he had it made like I think 20 or 25 years ago. He had that little uniform made for his son. And when he sent me uniforms 
uh, oh. a couple of years ago, he sent me that. He said, "Hey, here's this. Here's this for Royce." So, in, yeah, in in my films a couple of years ago, I put Royce in that. So, in one of my films, like that's official fan film canon, like that Yay. love both the next generation. Yay, that's great. But it, but it reminded me of of the love that we share, not only with each other at these conventions, but with our kids. We get to yes. share those things. Yeah. And that's something that we really didn't have when we were growing up, you know, right. um, you know, cause to those kids, wow. I got to meet the the cat doctor. I got to meet, you know, a green lady. I got to meet, you know, at, at real comic conventions, I got to meet Iron Man. I got to meet Batman. You know, these right. kids live in a completely different world than what we did, you know, and that's positivity of these things. That's why they're important. Yeah. You know, um, but it's it was so much fun to do. It was. So it really was. So you 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 got to do not only the booth. Were you on what, panel with the Axonar panel? I was on the Axonar panel. Yeah. What was what was that all about? Um, I I didn't get to I didn't get to stay. I think I left. I think I left the day before your panel, or you maybe did. the two days before. Yeah. What what was that all about? Because I we haven't spoken about that since, and I'm I'm curious. What what was that about? So it was a panel talking about <clears throat> the finishing, <clears throat> the finishing of Axanar. Uh, we were introducing two new characters. <clears throat> uh, one character is, um, oh, uh, Rob Hayes, who plays uh, Pilot DeVille in uh, Interlude on the um on the Aries, but he's also in the two the last two sections of act uh, the last two sessions of axonar and then i can't remember his name but he is playing the young um lieutenant chang who is the second for um uh karn and uh, it was his it was his first con uh of of this kind <clears throat> but it was introducing them, talking about how we're finishing, um, how it's gone, um, and um, it was a good. It was a, it was a nice panel. It was a very nice panel. Some great questions. Um, some talking about um, when is it going to be done? How's it going? To, how's it working? Uh, what it's like in um, what it's like in Georgia with um, with Airy Studios. And uh, he also mentioned. A number of the side projects that they have. Um, uh, I was the one who mentioned how Alec is working with Gwinnett County um, um, high schools to um, to have them film, to have them learn about um, film production. So the kids are coming in and they're um, and they're learning how to write, produce, direct, act, uh, use all the equipment. Um, I think they all end up doing their own little Star Trek film at the end. Um, and then uh, the Animal Rescue um, talked a little bit about Crystal's stuff uh, going on. I know she's she's really gearing up for the Supergirl no more. Uh, but uh, And then we, we talked a little bit about Interlude. Um, and um, people want to know what's going to happen now when Axanar is, when Alec is finished. And I actually asked Alec about that um, recently, and he said, Anybody can anybody can continue Axanar. It's the only the only thing is that he can't, according to the according to the settlement. So, you know, like if you if you or John or um, Samuel Cockings or anybody else wanted to continue this universe, they could. Yeah, uh, but um, it was a good panel. Good panel. A well well represented. Uh, I heard yours was just off the wall, off the charts. It was uh it it was fun. I I have to admit, uh, you know, I've never done anything. Uh, you know, the 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 auditorium was was huge, uh, with you know a, a little intimidating. Thankfully, the audience wasn't uh, as huge as the auditorium. I think I I would have probably wet myself. You know, um, but it it was something where, um, I think Josh put it. <clears throat> I think Josh put it um, perfectly where, you know, very, very few people get to do what we've done there. Um, you know, say what you want about the films we've done, say what you want about um, the accomplishments or whatnot. Um, but very few people get to say that they've been uh, 
you know, a, a host on a panel right. at, at Star Trek Las Vegas or, or whatever it's called now. Um, I, you know, <laughs> for lack of better words, Star Trek Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's, it's one of those things where um, I was nervous, but, you know, I mean, obviously having done, you know, some type of, you know, public speaking or podcasting type stuff, you know, you, you get kind of used to it. You kind of tend to tune out what you're not focusing on at the moment. You focus right. on, you know, the speaker, the question, you know, and, you know, it, it's easy not to, to let your cheeks get too flush and you pass out, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, I was, I was nervous. I, I was glad it was a smaller audience. Cause like I said, you know, uh, and I was glad my friends were in the front row, you know, cause uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I didn't want to get buckle kneed and, and fall over. Um, but uh, it was, it was fun. Cause uh I know everybody at my work, um, you know, they were, they were excited that, that I got to go do something. Cause, uh, I remember when I was, you know, I'd be on the phone with a fan filmmaker or an actor or someone, uh, for years, they'd be like, Oh, there's that fan film Nazi, you know, and now here I am going to Las Vegas, you know, going on panel and, and they're like, Oh, it's his dreams coming true. You know, um, but it's, it's, I, I felt going to Vegas, getting to know, you, you know, meeting you for the first time, meeting Alec for the first time, going to dinner with you guys, uh, you know, more than just an online presence with you guys, but actually meeting you guys. Yeah. Um, it was, it, it was something where I was like, man, I hope this is something we get to do more of. Um, you know, like yearly thing, you know, yeah. um, it, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm sorry. I'll tell you a little, um, <clears throat> so I'll, we all know who Mark Largent is. <clears throat> yes. And and Mark has done some absolutely fabulous things. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Mark was there, of course, uh, because Mark um, did the introduction to City on the Edge of Foreclosure. Um, and he had his panel. And he was genuinely nervous. I mean, he was really, really worried about um, his panel. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what people are going to think about this. This is just something that I came up with. And uh, and I'm going, are you nuts? This is this is great. Excellent. This is fabulous. What you've done with Axed We Are and Amut Time and all these other ones. I'm I'm in awe of you. Yeah. Like I'm in awe of you as well, you know, with all of what you've done. And and you just remember that these are just people. These are just normal people, and we're all uh, we're all worried about how we're going to be how we're going to be seen, how we're going to be represented, and that's the other great thing about Star Trek because you do something in this universe, and you know it doesn't matter whether or not you see the string that's attached to the model. You know, it doesn't matter whether or not the costume is not exact issue. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not you're canon or not. You're building something that means something to you. And everybody sees that. Yeah. I mean, there are going to be some people who are going to go, well, that's not where the that's not where that button is on the on the console. Right. You know? And you know, fuck them. <laughs> exactly. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. You do you do what you love and if the if the heart is behind it, that's what we see. Well, and that's that that's the thing I I think, and I've 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 said this a lot. I I feel like I've said this a lot more this past year than I have in in you know years. But I I feel as if the more modern fan films have become part of this community of of being just friends um more so than than has been when i first started because when i first started it very much so was i want my fan film to be the best no i want my fan film to be the best no i my fan film you know right and the way it is now it very much is Hey, Josh, do you want to be in my film? Sure, Vance, no problem. Hey, Gary, do you want to be in my film? Sure, no problem. Hey, Steven, do you want to be in it? Sure. Hey, Alec, do you want to be in it? Ah, sure, you know. Right. And 
and we're all just friends and and we're all just people i mean you and i both know my uh, none of my uniforms fit me and, and it's not uncommon to see fucking sneakers if i'm walking on the bridge like we all know yeah. um and half the time if you're in advanced film you're probably going to be on my monitor like there's there's little to no movement in the cameras there you know which which means when there is movement hey cool he, he got off his sofa you know um <laughs> <laughs> but but you also know me as a person and, and you know that I don't take myself too seriously, you know? Um, and I think that's all of us as people, like we've all seen Mark's films and, and we're all as friends, um, huge fans, right. um, because we know what he's doing and we're not going to sit there and nitpick something if we're like, Oh, that's technically not right. No, that's, no, we're, we're fans of what you're doing and we're friends at the same time um, and we're supportive. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're not sitting there going, you know, technically you're breaking discoveries, third rule of, of what, no, fuck off. That's not, that's not what you do. Right. Like you made something fun. It's a great watch and it's a wonderful way to, you know, if you got a release on Friday night, cool. You know, it's, it saves me from going to the movies, paying 30 bucks in popcorn that was old and stale, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, exactly. but that's the the support that you get from uh, the fan film community from each other. It, it's wonderful, you know. Um, and you're right; you do get those assholes that are like, you know, oh, that doesn't fit. You know, they need to tuck that back. Ah, you're usually the fans we don't really want, you know, because you don't right. you don't get it. And those people are usually the ones that haven't done anything in the the fan film community, you know. Right. Um, but. Uh, no, I, I, I wish I wish I could have been there uh, to see his because I, you know, his I, I, I'd love to pick his brain. And he'll be on a pizza roll diary. One of these uh, uh, one. Good. Of, good. I, I'm going to be I'm doing them through the rest of the year. And uh, then I'll I'll be done with pizza roll diaries because I've been doing them. Uh, I think I'll have like 70 pizza roll diaries. Um, but he was one of the ones that I wanted to talk to because I've never actually physically talked to him. Um, right. But he's, he seems like such a warm, genuine guy. He is. You know? He really and, is. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, so before, cause we, we've got about another 18 minutes before we're our hours over. Yeah. Um, so going into your Admiral Slater, mm -hmm. you are like, you are forever, <laughs> forever cast as that, you know, that is you. Um, what was it like playing Admiral Slater for, for the, the little bit in Axanar and then returning for it uh, when Jonathan Lane asked you, hey, we got interlude coming. Are you interested? What, what was it like returning to that role? And what are your thoughts on where you want to go going forward with the character? Because I know for me, when people approach me on, hey, I want Menard for this. I I'm pretty open and I very seldom say no. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only time I've ever said no is when someone asks, you know, Hey, I want you to do Menard. And I'm like, well, can I see a script? And then I read it. And the only time I've said no is when someone wanted me to like start shooting kids on a planet. And I'm like, the fuck would Menard do this for? No. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. I was like, that's one, that's not Starfleet too. That's not Menard. Like, uh, is right. this mirror? Yeah. Or what, what is this? You know? Yeah. So what was it like playing in Axanar? Mm -hmm. What was it? What were your thoughts when you were asked to return? And then where would you like to go forward with the character? Okay. Well, so as we all know, um, I really had absolutely nothing to do with, um, with how Slater started in Axanar. All I was told was uh, we need it. We need a picture of a captain. Um, I didn't know where it was going to uh, be. I figured it was going to be like on somebody's view screen or something like that, or maybe on a wall. Uh, but then he became a pivotal point. And it was the whole idea. Um, Alec once asked me, give me a timeline for him. So I wrote up a bio for him. And in my mind, um, he'd always been the <clears throat> he'd always been more into communications, more into diplomacy, more into um, finding a way to Work forward just one second. Yes, hon. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, hon. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, 
yeah, he'd always been the one to work through an issue to try to to try to find a to try to find a solution for it. Um, <clears throat> so I had him starting the Starfleet Diplomatic Corps after um, uh, after uh, he was re removed to CNC. And I also had him spending a lot of time on Vulcan because he admired the way Vulcans did their diplomacy, or at least in our part of the universe, not the Discovery universe. Um, so I did that. Alec, I think he has it somewhere. <laughs> Alec has so much stuff, so you don't know where it is. Right. Uh, then I saw Axanar and this mythos built, and I just sort of went, I have absolutely no clue of what's going on. And then I, and then I was asked to go to Axicon in 2018, uh, in in Atlanta, and we were with the um, with the Honor Harrigan with the Honor Harrigan people, um, <clears throat> and I just kept getting all these questions about all of it. And I spent some time with Jonathan, and he was talking about um, how he would like to see it. And so he and Alec and I basically sat down, I think over pizza or something like that. And uh, they're going, well, what happens to Slater? You know, and I'm going, well, he's still an admiral and he still needs to be part of the, um, uh, part of Starfleet considering we're in a war and you can't just, you can't just court martial. I mean, they didn't court martial. They, they just took the position away from him. So what do you do with him? And Jonathan's over here. Oh, and this wasn't over pizza. It was at Alex's house. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan is just sitting on the sofa and he's just sort of going, hmm, I got an idea. You know? And that's when he said, um, Slater becomes the head of Star the Commandant of Starfleet Academy. And he starts training the, um, uh, the future captains. He starts training the people that we have to get out there to fight. And we're both going, well, that's not a bad idea. You know, and um, Jonathan has continued on that. He has continued on the idea of learning more about Slater and more of what Slater's role past Axanar is. And I think it's a great idea. I really think it's a great idea. He, um, he gave me the, um, gave me the script for interlude and i went oh wow slater's got a little clandestine thing going on which is rather cool that's very nice we're we're, we're keeping him in the loop this is nice uh and then um i've seen a um i've seen a working um sort of novella uh just a little short story of um garth's last um time on earth and he ends up meeting Slater um, at Starfleet Academy, and um, we, they, and they talk about um, their roles continuing on, and it's it's really interesting. Um, it's nice to have a character that has been that has really taken on a um, um, a respect and a um, and a love from the people who are watching. It's just it's just really really neat. You know, and to, and to be and to be the one who is um synonymous with that, it's just um it's it's an honor and a privilege. Well, it, it it's it, it's it's kind of cool. Um and and very few people uh especially in in fan films. Um very few people get to have a character that has kind of a a story arc and one that kind of takes, yeah, exactly. Um, that takes kind of a life of its own. You know, um, a lot of people kind of play a character, and they're you know either a one and done, and that's it, or you know they have a character, but it, there's not much to it. But to have a character where you know it, it there is a lot fleshed out there, um, and you know there's backstory to it. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a unique thing to have. Um, even in some television shows, a lot of people will just play a character and there's nothing there, but, you know, to have a character that it's like, no, no, we were here, 
and now we're here and now we're here and then we end up here you know that that's it's kind of a unique thing like i said especially in fan films yeah um it, it's kind of a unique pleasure because it's like you know you you see this arc and you're like it wasn't there before and that's something that you know right a lot of people a lot of people watch and they're like, man, that's, that's kind of cool, you know, and the, uh, the subtle changes in your character development and how you, you portray events, you know, exactly. Um, so, so that being said, um, where would you like to take the character? If you had your way to do anything, where, where would you like to take the character? Um, man, I'd love to see, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm just gonna be honest here. I would love to see Slater in action. Mm. I would love to see. I would love to see Slater on the bridge. You know, just just for a just for an instant. You know, because um, one, I'd love to be on the bridge, <laughs> whether or not it's a Connie or uh, or an Aries class or whatever. Um, I'd love to see what he could do when he is pressed into um, a situation. Uh, I think prior to being uh, the Commandant of Starfleet Academy, I, I, here's the way I look at it. If you make it to the Admiralty, you have to have, I, you would have had to have had command of a ship. Um, because I think that's inherent of the way Starfleet works. You need to work in that direction. You can't be a paper pusher. You can't be you can't be a waste extraction and get to Admiralty. <laughs> right. Yeah. And even if even if you were communications, you know, um, or if you were science, uh, you had to show some leadership skills to be right. able to be a, to, to be able to be in the Admiralty. So um, you take a look at all of the people who were pressed into service in TOS. You look at um, all of the ambassadors. You look at all of the diplomats who had absolutely no clue of what to do. Um, I think Slater would be a lot more seasoned, a lot more understanding of what he needs to do. And he would also understand everybody around him has his purpose. And that purpose is to tell him what he needs to know at that particular amount of time so he can formulate a decision and flip the ship around on a 180, um, hit the hit thrusters, fire phasers at a spot and make it work to get them out of there and to get everybody safe. You know, um, I'd love to see that happen. Um, you know, just partially it's action. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd also like to see what happens if um, Slater starts um, interacting with other uh, characters. And not just um, not just canon characters, but um, characters in fan films. Um, I like we like we've said. I'd love to see Slater with Menard. Uh, I'd love to see um, Slater having to meet Pixie. You know, uh, who's who's one of my favorite people. I love Pixie. Um, She's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Matthew, so Matthew Bracy says, "I just got in here. Is this a script in the works or one that has been made to watch yet?" No, this is all spitballing. This is this is this if, is two minds at work here. Where you're you're seeing, I, I believe you're seeing the genesis of something. Because I know whenever I ask a question, uh, there's always a reason behind it, Matthew. So um, right, yeah. Uh, all I can say is stay tuned. Yeah. So and power uh, five four three, which is Sam, uh, says, hey, Sam. "How's it going, guys? Hope to see Slater in more projects." To that, I I will say. You are definitely going to see uh, Admiral Slater more projects. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, but go ahead with go ahead with what you were saying. No, no, I think um, I think that's a great idea. It's um, it's spitballing. It's um, trying to figure out ways to make it work. Um, I've um, I have some ideas in my mind. Um, it's just whether or not anybody would want to listen to me. <laughs> well, I I have, and I can say this. I know at some point I'd like to go to Alex's sets, um, and there, there, like there, there's there's two stories that I'd like to do. Um, like one, <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen the picture of me in the mullet wig in a Starfleet uniform. Oh yes, uh, yes, I've seen that. I, 
Yeah, business. I, I do want to be in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I do want to get Admiral Slater in that film just because I think that would be uh uh something where that would kind of blow expectations of like, oh, that'd be an easy way to get Admiral Slater in a film. Um and it would be fun to work, you know, um something easy to do. Um but uh, you talking about getting Admiral Slater in an, in an action scene. Um, cause I've, I've written action scenes and I can film them fairly quickly. Um, cause again, I do everything on a cell phone and it's not hard. Um, right. but granted it, it won't look like interlude. Um, or, you know, it, like I'm, I'm not very, I'm not very tech savvy and my stuff isn't glossed over, but I, I could do something. Um, so if I ever get to Alex's set, um, you are welcome to join me and I will write a scene for you. Um, so that is the open invitation to come and know that if, if I do get there, um, Admiral Slater will have an action scene in the film. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'd, love so, to, I'd love to go down. I'd love to go down with you to, uh, to Fayetteville and film there and put us in a Connie. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm up for it. Good. Good. If we, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm planning to go, uh, it, you know, fingers crossed. If, if we, if we, uh, can make it work. I talked to, to Wolf and to Dan to see if I can go to, uh, uh, warp 66 to see if we can make that. Um, you're welcome to come, uh, if we shoot Republic or another con star, um, uh, later on next year, um, you're welcome to join us there. If, right. if uh, if you want, um, like my, I said, there's my schedule. Yeah. Yeah, if uh, you know, I'm I'm always up to whichever bridge we're on to shoot. Um, we're you know, if you can make it uh, to whichever set, you know, because like I said, for me to shoot an action sequence, honestly, you know, to get what I'm envisioning shouldn't take ten minutes. <laughs> you know, because it, it for me the way I shoot, I'm always like, you know, I just get in your face. I'm like, all right, say this, and then I go to the next person, say this, go to the next person, say this. You know, I'm I'm very. You know, I'm very quick, cheap, you know, um, I'm, I'm like a hooker, you know, I'm quick and cheap, you know, uh, <laughs> cheaper. So, uh, hookers aren't cheap. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. There you go. Um, but, uh, I, I think, um, I think we can make something work. Um, like I said, it wouldn't be, uh, as, as high caliber as, as a Josh, uh, film, but it would, uh, it would at least get you in the chair and, and get something for you. But, uh, yeah. anytime I'm on set, man understand that even if i don't send you the invite please if you see that hey vance is going hey dude i want to come understand yeah. that you have an open invitation thank you thank so, you yeah so, always so but all right well our time is almost over um hold on just a second uh so we had a oh we had a comment earlier dustin d said menard how about getting captain foley and commander samuel cockings and admiral slater and alec peters in a high action episode uh dust dustin d I, I don't think you understand what a Menard film is. My my action packed film is getting four people on my monitor. That's that's high action to me. That's high octane. Right, right. Um, so uh, no, if if I could ever make that work um, in a film, and and trust me, uh, with my with my Menard mullet film um, that I've got going, uh, I think that's just the film to get all of those people in. Uh, even if it's for a quick cameo, um, but that's not that's not necessarily high octane. Um, so it may not be the film you want. So yeah. stay tuned. Um, uh, Vance, can I do a can I do a shameless plug? Absolutely, <laughs> so, absolutely. So I I tell a lot of people um, uh, Star Trek is my love, but uh, my other love is music. And um, actually, I'm right now in my I'm in my studio. Uh, at the University of Missouri. So, you know, if I tune over this way, there's my, there's the grand and there's part of my studio. Um, I was able last Friday to do a concert with a chamber music series here in Columbia, Missouri. This was the first time that I had sung in front of a live audience since the pandemic. And um, a lot of us who are, who are performers, who are singers, this is something that we've been waiting for, for, for months, for years, and it meant a lot. And, uh, the nice thing is that that show it's part of a, it was part of a, um, of a multi-instrumental and vocal thing, um, that we did. Um, it is on YouTube. 
And I think this is the last day that they're going to have, have it on for free. And it is the Odyssey Plowman um, YouTube channel. And I do three pieces by Samuel Barber. Um, they're in English. Uh, but um, anybody who wants to see them and listen to them and watch me perform, I'm a bit of a showman. And um, let me know what you think, you know. Um, it's uh, it's things like this that we've all that we've all been waiting for. We've all been waiting for um, to see live uh, people live, and uh, those of us who do it, we've been wanting to um, be able to give to an audience. And I know that's what you do with uh, with your show, with your uh, with your series, because you're giving. Um, but this is the other way that I give, and um, I just love to see people. I'd love to hear what people think about it. Is it is it on your YouTube or is it on? No, it is. Else? It is on the Odyssey Plowman YouTube channel. Okay. Um, after the show, if you could send me the 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 their YouTube uh, link address, sure. I'll sure. put that in the description of uh, this uh, video, uh, this piece of World Diary. So um, everybody in the chat or, or anyone on the rewind. Um, Click in the description and you'll see the link because I'll, I'll put that in the link and uh, you'll be able to click right on over um, yeah. so to their channel and you should be good to go. So great. Awesome. So uh, Sam asks, uh, would any of Slater's children be in Starfleet? How would Steven look in a first contact uniform? I wonder. Uh, well, don't forget, Sam, there's always quad lithium. Yeah. Admiral Slater might touch the quad lithium and zap right on up to the 24th century. So you never know. That's possible. Who knows? Yeah. So, all right. Well, with that in mind, we've we've hit our hour. Uh, Stephen, I I want to say um, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming on the Pizza Roll Diaries with me. Thank um, you. And I I want to reiterate: anytime I go to the studio, um, you are always welcome, uh, and I I look forward to working with you. And you will I be getting a script. With you too. Awesome. You will be getting a script from me uh, at some future point once I get out of the, the the Batman fan film that I'm writing. I'm gonna go back to Star Trek, and you'll be getting a script from me. So uh, yeah. you'll be hearing from me soon. All right, so, be good to Royce, okay? I will. All right. With All that right. being said, everybody in the chat, uh, be genuine, be safe, and keep on geeking on, guys. Yeah.